All right, this morning, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. And I remember um, being a new Christian and uh, reading through the book of Acts and uh, not really understanding most of it. It just was parts of it the Lord really would speak to me, but then a lot of it I didn't know who these people were and didn't have any context for them, so a lot of the information didn't seem like it even stayed in my head at all. But I do remember early on reading this part and thinking, man, there's a whole lot of space given to like this one part of the journey. Paul makes so many journeys um, in his life, and then Luke uh, takes, he's got a limited amount of papyrus. He's only writing 28 chapters, and he gives so much space to this one event in Paul's life. And I think at the time, uh, as I was confused about that, why so much space or, or, or energy spent on uh, the details of a, of a journey um, but then as I grew in the Lord and I started having trials and I started having things happening in my life that I didn't understand why they were happening and I started having things happen that I wished weren't happening and I started having things that I wished weren't happening that I didn't understand why they were happening that I hated they were happening and they made me want to quit then I started getting happy that this part was there because this is almost like watching a cartoon um, if, if you... Uh, haven't read through this section, I'd encourage you to read through it. It won't take you long to go back to where he d- gets the idea that he wants to go to Jerusalem with an offering and read just straight through the end, but only pay attention to the idea that you're watching a cartoon. That the person thinks this thing is happening, and every time he turns a corner, a cartoon hammer comes out of a wall and just smashes him. Or someone throws oil on the road and his car spins out, or someone throws tax out, or there's a smoke screen that comes. Um, he has so many things happen to him, and they happen successively, and his heart is so pure in it. Now, we know our hearts aren't pure, and so I don't mean in the sense that Paul has no sin, but Paul's desire was to have people love each other. Now, that's about as good of a desire as you could have. He's on the best mission that a person could be on, which is to, to emphasize the oneness and the unity in the body of Christ, and that one group is being sacrificial and taking of their resources financially, they pooled them together, and they're taking them with a delegation from those congregations to a group of people who are totally different than them to just say, we love you. Here's something from us, no strings attached. And when does that ever happen in your life? It hardly ever happens. You, you live your whole life and you'll probably count it on one hand, or if you're really lucky, two hands. The times when somebody just is spontaneously led by the Spirit to go out of their way to do something, no strings attached, to just bless you. Uh, It's an amazing experience. And so Paul's in the middle of something like that. But then when you read the account and only pay attention to, like, what happens to him because he had this idea? Well, let's see. The offerings seems to be received, but then the legalism of the church, they tell him, go in and offer sacrifices with these guys. Everybody hears that you're not really Jewish enough. Show them that you really are Jewish enough. That's a great way to say thank you, by the way, uh, is ask people to jump through some religious hoop. And he does that, and then he gets in a, a riot. He's almost beaten to death. He's rescued by the Romans, who rescue him to tie him up so they can beat him and find out why the people were beating him, because that's how you should always solve a beating. So then he's held as a prisoner for over two years with no charges against him. As a political prisoner, the government leaders only holding him, hoping that he'll, they'll get bribe money, and holding him to do his enemies a favor. No charges against him. When they finally say, look, we'll just send you back to Jerusalem. And he knows going back to Jerusalem is a death sentence, and God's told him that he's supposed to go to Rome now. He had the heart to go to Jerusalem. He had the idea he'd go to Rome now. He says, I'm going to Rome. He tells the guy, I have the right as a Roman citizen to appeal to Rome. And so off to Rome you go. Well, we're now in that passage, the next two chapters, off to Rome. You think, well, whew, wow, he's finally away from those Jewish guys. And now it'll be good. Well, what happens on the way to Rome? He gets shipwrecked, but somehow they survive the shipwreck. Then they go ashore. And then he gets bit by a poisonous snake. And you think, it's a cartoon. Like, this isn't real. Except for my life looks like this sometimes. And your life looks like this sometimes. 
This is a section of scripture that I think these details are, are highlighted by Luke and emphasized because many times our life will take on these characteristics where you say, I don't know who taped the kick me sign on my back, but whoever did, please take it off because all I was trying to do was this. And I know this was God's will and I know this is what God wanted me to do. And my reward for that is beating and false imprisonment for years and then finally, the only thing I can do is to appeal to the pagan authority. Then I'm shipped off to the other side of the world only to be almost killed in a shipwreck, only to be almost killed by a poisonous snake, and finally ending up in Rome. And we end the, the book of Acts with Paul in prison in Rome. And the start was, I want to go to Jerusalem and be a blessing to people. And the end of it is, I'm in Rome as a prisoner. And, and so this is a great section of scripture, and there's so many good lessons in this um, passage that we could focus on. And I want to look at something that Paul says while they're in the storm. He sails off with the Roman uh, soldiers who are guarding prisoners that are heading to Rome. They, they join up with some merchants on a merchant ship and they make their way. And as they're sailing along, they uh, get involved in this big storm and the storm becomes so bad that they, they know they're going to die. And um, it gets about as bad as it can get. And the Lord speaks to Paul. And so he shares with the guys um, what, the, what the Lord has said to him. And in his sharing with them, he says two things that are um, two, the two great questions that, that human beings have to answer in their life. And Paul has answered them. And he says in verse 22, or Acts 27, verse 22, he says, Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. So therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island, and so tells the story about how they shipwreck. So Paul had a visit from an angel, and Paul apparently had been praying for his own safety, but for the safety of all those that were on the ship, praying that God would deliver them, asking God for help. And it, he probably had been praying this for many days. They, they'd been in this storm for a while. But an angel appears to Paul in the night and says, look, you're going to Rome, you're not going to die, and I've heard your prayers, no one else is going to die, but the ship is going to sink. And you're gonna lose, they're going to lose the ship but everybody's going to live. And so Paul tells the guys, hey, take heart. We're going to live through this, man. God spoke to me. And, and so uh, at this point, um, they're, they're starting to listen to Paul more. And as they go through this, the, especially the, the chief Roman who's in charge of Paul really begins to trust him. But in the middle of this statement here is a is a very simple little sentence by Paul, like half a sentence in verse 23. And it states his relationship with God and the reason for his life. And the two great questions that every person has to ask, number one, who do you belong to? You have to, you have to ask yourself that question because even if you don't ask it, there's an answer. And you have to, de you have to decide for yourself who you're going to belong to. Don't let it just happen, because if you let it happen without thinking about it, you'll belong to the wrong person. Who do you belong to? And then the second, the second question is, who are you serving, or what's the purpose of your life? Who do you belong to, and what are you doing? <laughs> Those are the two great questions, but they're in an order. What you're doing is not more important than who you belong to. Who you belong to will be the answer for what you're doing, and you'll only understand what you're doing if you can first understand who you belong to. But Paul was in a very difficult situation, and when the angel appears to him as he shares with the guys, he shares his relationship with the God who sent the angel with these two statements. The God to whom I belong and who I serve. Now, every person belongs to a God. Every person in this room belongs to a God. Now, you might say, well, I just came with my friend. I'm an atheist. I don't really belong to any God. Yes, you do. You do. You, every person has something that they've let conquer them. 
Now, I spent years not believing in God, and so I can speak for myself as a person who didn't believe in God. There was someone I belonged to. I belonged to myself. I did what I wanted, and I, I did it to my own detriment, but I did what I wanted. There was some master passion of my life. So for a person to say, well, I don't believe there's any God, and so I'm not subject to any God. If we followed you around with a camera, by, by the end of a day or a couple of days, we could we could uh, get a, a group of people who don't know you and just show the video and say, who do you think this person belongs to? It wouldn't be hard to tell. There's something that's mastered you. There's something that you're living for. There's something that's conquered you. There's something that you've given yourself to. You just better make sure it's worthy of, of a soul. It's worthy of a human life created in the image of God, created by God. Because we're very unique and very special in all the universe. And we've sinned and separated ourselves from God, and we've marred that so much. But there's only, there's only one uh, group in the whole universe that was worthy of the blood of Jesus, and that was you guys. You're worthy of the blood of Jesus. Now, worthy in the sense that God loves us so much, that the love of God is our worth. It's not in ourselves. But God made us, God loves us so much that he gave his son for us. He didn't die for angels. Jesus didn't die on the cross for the devil. Those spirits, they made their choices. They're living with their choices. The human beings made their choices, and God said, over my dead body. So when we, dis we have to decide, because we're going to live our lives, we'll belong to someone or something. And Paul had settled this. That's why in the middle of a storm, in the middle of an amazingly confusing season in life, that you have to think, um, how would you endure this? You know, how would you keep up hope? How would you be able to go on? What would, you, what would you tell yourself in the morning after a year and nine months in the jail and you're thinking, what is with this Felix guy? And what is, how long is this going to happen? And, when, and what is, when's justice going to be served? Or, or when there's a change of government and thinking, well, the new governor will clearly see this as a farce and this is where I'll get released. And then you can tell right away once, second into the conversation, this guy's as bad as the other guy, and I'm staying for longer. And thinking, what is this about? Lord, I'm an apostle. You called me to go, and now I'm in prison. How could you call me as an apostle and then incarcerate me for over two years? The very name that you've given me, an apostle, means one sent out, not one captured. <laughs> it's the opposite. Have you ever been in a place in your life where everything within you, the calling on your life and the reason for living, and then you look at your circumstance and you think, how does this make any sense? And then it goes on and on and on and on and on. How do you endure that? There's only one way I think that you ever could, and you, you have to be able to retreat into the reality of who do you belong to? It's the only way you'll ever escape the depression that comes from the confusion of, the circumstances of life. Because our, our whole existence is about relationship. It's about relationship. It's about having a relationship with God. Now, Paul's going to talk about service also, but relationship always goes before service. The God who I belong to, the God whose I am, and the God that I serve. It's always in that order. It's never the other way. It's never, I serve God and, the, and I belong to God. It's always, I belong to God and I serve God. And that's extremely important. Of course, you know the famous passage. You can turn there if you want and look at it. Luke chapter 10. At the end of the chapter, verse 38, it happened as they went that Jesus entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve you alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. That's a story we know. Uh, in fact, we even sort of use these sentences, you know, I want to be a Mary, not a Martha, and this kind of becomes part of the Christian uh, language that we use as we try to have shorthand, shortcuts to communicate a concept. What's happening here is here's a person that's preoccupied with serving. Who's she serving? Jesus. Can you get better than that? Apparently you can. 
She's serving Jesus and she's bitter. <laughs> have you ever been bitter when you were serving Jesus? If you haven't, keep serving Jesus for a while. It'll come. You'll have your day. Serve Jesus long enough, you'll be yelling at someone about how unfair it is. And Hey, you can serve Jesus, but you can miss the main thing, right? There's only one thing necessary, Jesus said. Mary's chosen that thing. We love this story, and it's just a short few verses, and it captures one of the most important lessons for any person to ever learn, and that is, what's the most important thing in your life? And you can find out what's the most important thing in your life by how worried and troubled you are about how many things. Paul's in the middle of a storm in our chapter, and there's a bunch of guys on the boat, and they're all thinking they're going to die, and Paul's met with his God, and Paul has some kind of peace. He's got assurance for the future. He's got direction, though he's the one in, he's the one in chains. He's the one that's going from prison to prison, in prison, in a boat with no rights, and, and falsely accused and shouldn't even be there anyways. It's illegal, really, what's happened to him. And yet he's the person that seems to have grasped, I know what's happening here. I know what's going to happen. The boat's going down. We're all going to live. I'm going to Rome. The God that I belong to. That's, that's where you settle these things. The God that I belong to. See, Martha had some guests at her house. Maybe you had guests at your house yesterday for the 4th of July. Or maybe you had to prepare a bunch of things to get ready for the 4th of July. Or you think of those times when you have someone important coming and you want everything to be just right. We have a lot of empathy for Martha. I've never really wanted to beat up on her too much. Um, she seems like someone you don't want to have made mad, like when you get to heaven. She'd be with a rolling pin, you know, ready to, for everybody that gave her trouble for 2,000 years of church history. Bam! Yes. Lord, just redeem me for in a few minutes, you know. I've got to hit a few preachers in the head. I mean, she's taking a beating, poor thing. But how would you react if Jesus was coming to your house? How big of a deal would that be? You're hosting him. The disciples are there. It's, it's just a big deal. And, and so she's made it a big deal, and it is a big deal. But what happens in our lives, we lose sight of the most important thing, and things become a big deal, bigger than they are. And listen, if we lose sight of the real thing and the most important thing, then things that are a big deal... That's that so easy for them to become colossal. That's so easy for them to turn into something that they really aren't. Yes, it's a big deal Jesus is coming to your house. But you do understand that he's the son of God and he's sitting here teaching and it's not really time to be stressed out about the little finger foods. And you're feeding a bunch of fishermen. They don't even notice what you're put out. They're, you got a bunch of guys sitting there. You could throw out anything. You, you know, I, I, you know, we have the women's tea, and it's just very amazing. If we have a guy's thing, it's just slop, just anything. <laughs> Buckets, you could, the guys don't care. She, what She's concerned about it, and it's important, and it's a big deal, but, she, but it's, taken on a, it's taken on a place in her life, and it's messed up her heart, so that now she's looking at her sister saying, something's wrong with my sister. Her, her life's out of order, and now she's out of order with someone she should love and be one with, and she's not in order with that person. That's what happens in our lives. We lose sight of the most important thing, and then we get out of order with the people that we're supposed to be in love with. And then she's out of order with Jesus. Because not only is she mad at her sister, but then she starts telling Jesus what Jesus is doing wrong. Have you done that yet? Have you told Jesus that what he's doing is wrong? If you haven't yet, you will, shortly. Because he'll do things that you think are wrong. He'll do things that you won't understand, that you won't like, that you won't want to have happen. And they'll go on way longer than they should, and they'll be unfair, and someone else will be having something else happen, and you'll get out of order with other people, and then you'll get out of order with him. And so making something that's good and important, making it more important than it is, will really send you off kilter and out of balance. And we know this, that's why this story is familiar, that's why we refer to it, and that's why we try to remind ourselves that Mary chose the better part. What did Mary choose? I know who I belong to. Whatever service I'm going to be part of is going to come out of that. that the most important thing and the focus is going to be, I know that the one that I belong to, and the one that I belong to is seated here, and he's sharing us his heart. It's not time for me to serve. It's not time for us to be panicking about the sandwiches or the shawarma or whatever, whatever she was trying to make. 
It isn't really time for that. I need to put that thing aside, and I need to be able to get my mind and settle it on the reality of what's happening. And that Jesus is here, and he's saying something to us, and that, that's more than anything. Now, if he looks at me and, and, and says, well, you know, we're through now. If, if you guys have work that you need to do, then I'm going to jump up and run and go do my work. But if, if he's going to be opening his heart to us, I'm going to be listening to his heart. And Jesus, he, he said Mary has chosen that part and she wouldn't lose it. Now, this idea of relationship is key. The Bible uses terms to describe what Jesus did for us on the cross and his nature, and it uses words that are ex- very significant. For example, the word redemption. We are saved by a work of redemption. That's a very religious word. Now, um, when I was a kid, I'm, I'm old enough to have been a little boy when they had these things that um, people, when they would buy things, they would get stamps. And then you could buy on the product. It was a way to market your product. And with the products, you get stamps, and you put these stamps in a book. And then they had a, a redemption center with the word redeem in it. It's where you go get redemption. Now, Jesus wasn't there, and his blood wasn't there, but you could still redeem things there because that's what the word redeem means, that you would take the stamps in the book, and if you got enough stamps, then you could go to the place, and they would, it would like when you play skee ball and you get all those tickets, and you get 5,000, and you can get a spider ring. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? So I got my very first baseball mitt uh, from stamps. Um, I was playing baseball, I didn't have a mitt, and my mom had saved all these stamps. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> I was, this whole idea of redemption is a big deal, but I just thought of my mom. Um, God bless her. So, so anyway, you go to this place, and you, you, you give something to get something. Right? Redemption. You give something to get something. So we're redeemed. What does that mean? Someone gave something. See, you could say my mom bought my mitt for me, my glove, my baseball glove. My mom bought it. She bought it. How'd she do it? She gave something to get something. So I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus. God gave something to get something. I've been bought by God. I am, if you're looking at me and you want to understand me, you won't understand me unless you understand, first of all, that I belong to Jesus. Before you can say anything else about me, you have to say, I belong to Jesus. That's, that supersedes everything else. If you, if you look at me and you say, you're really sick, you got leukemia, you'd have to say first, but you belong to Jesus. If you say, you just lost your job, you, just, you have no hope for your future, your, your family was killed in a car wreck, you can say whatever you want to say to me. You could say anything about the most important things in my life, but there's something that's first before anything else. Somebody gave something to get something. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ is my redeemer. He's the one who gave something to get something. God the Father is my redeemer. He's the one who gave his son. Jesus gave his life. Uh, We already saw it a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 20. Paul reminds the elders of the church in Ephesus. He said um, that you should feed the flock of God which he purchased with his own blood. The word redemption has everything to do with getting something and making it your own. In the Old Testament, there's a number of statements about Israel, how they're the chosen people of God. And then there's a number of statements in the New Testament, how that now in Jesus Christ, we belong to God. We are his own special people, Paul wrote to Titus. God's own special people. Peter wrote and said, we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. God's own people. God has paid a price. And what was the price? The death of his son. Because the guilt of sin demanded the penalty for death, and the penalty for death, or the penalty for sin is death. The guilt of sin demands death. Jesus came and paid that penalty. God gave his son, so God has paid this price, but God's made us his own. I belong to God. 
Whatever, if, you, if I want to look at my life and keep things in order, I always have to start anything off. And How's it going? I belong to God. Now, if, if, you, if you ask someone, how's it going? And they say, well, I belong to God. You think, oh man, what's happened to you? Because <laughs> if you retreat to that tower, you know, well, the enemy must have really come through the gates and come over the wall and messed something up. But, but it, you could, it, someone said, how's your day going? Well, I belong to God. My day's going great. <laughs> I belong to God. That, that's the first and mo- most important thing. Because you belong to God, the Holy Spirit belongs in your heart. This word belong, I think, is just a really key concept. It's not really in the original language. Uh, it's kind of a... It's, you can't really translate it straight directly into English. It, the word... There is no... There is no pronouns the way we have pronouns ex- exactly the same as we have pronouns in, in the original language. So in verse 23, when he says, the, the, God, the way the New King James says, the God to whom I belong. The most literal way we could translate it is the God whose I am. Because the word for I am is there, and there's a little tiny two-letter pronoun that's there with it. The God whose I am. The idea of belonging, though, is in the is in the context, it's in the contextual meaning of the statement. I belong to God. So because I belong to God, guess what? The Holy Spirit belongs inside me. The Holy Spirit's home, because I belong to God, the Holy Spirit's home is my heart. Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, and he said, I'm praying for you that Christ would be at home in your heart by faith. And that makes sense, because if I now belong to God, I belong to God, then my body belongs to God, my heart belongs to God, I belong to God, then the rightful place for Jesus is to be inside me, to be in my heart. God belongs in my heart. That's a weird thing to say, doesn't it? I mean, you think, God doesn't belong in my heart. I don't know why he's in there. How did, I mean, it's a miracle. Well, yeah, that's true in one sense. But if God bought you and made you his own, then the Holy Spirit belongs inside of you. Here's another thing. You belong in heaven. That's your home. Have you been looking at the earth and wondering, where do I belong? I've known so many people in their life, they go through seasons in their life and they've had to move or they've had a change and they say, we just can't find a place where we belong. Well, guess what? You belong to God, so you don't belong here. You keep looking, you won't find it, even if you move to San Diego. (laughs) You can move to La Jolla. Some rich uncle that you never knew could die and give you all the money that you could ever want and you could go buy the home you always wished you had And you won't find where you belong because where you belong isn't here because you don't belong to yourself and you don't belong to earth. You belong to God because you were bought by God and the Holy Spirit belongs inside of you and he's telling you you belong to God, right? Paul said the Holy Spirit is given to us and he testifies to our spirit that we are the sons of God. We're the children of God. He bears witness with us. He's given us that confirmation inside. You belong to God. And when the devil is telling you, you don't belong to God, the Spirit's inside of you saying, you do belong to God. And because you belong to God, you belong with God. You belong in heaven. So in this earth, we're not going to find where we belong. We're not, we're not going to find it. You won't. Where you belong is in this place that Jesus is making for you. In my Father's house, Jesus said, that's where you belong, at home. You're not home yet. In my Father's house are many mansions, which is a really weird way to translate it. Uh, it literally is just dwelling places, but I don't think they wanted to say dwelling places, so they said mansions, the old King James. In my Father's house are many spots. There's places. My Father's house has room for everybody that's going to be there, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, Jesus said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come again and I will receive you to myself. Why? Because you belong to me. I'm coming back for you. You belong to me. You don't belong to this world. and You don't belong to the devil. You belong to me because I bought you. I redeemed you. I gave something to get something. And I made you mine. And I'm making a place for you. And I'm going to come and get you. And I'm going to bring you to that place. And you'll be with me always. Our lives on this planet, how long are they going to be if you live to a ripe old age? I mean, how many experiences will you be able to have? How much will you be able to see? What will you be able to do? Will it be long enough? I've met people when they were on their deathbed, they thought, man, I'm ready to go. I've had a long life. 
I've done many things. But you know, the people who said that to me were people who knew they were going to heaven. (laughs) They knew that, hey, my season here, it's been long enough. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go be where I'm supposed to be. I'm ready to be at, at my dad's house, to go be there with family, to be with my father, to be where I belong. All of this is because of love. God has made us so that we can belong to him because he loves us. It's not because we deserve it, because God loves us so much. When you think about the sense of God making us his own, it has everything to do with love. It has everything to do with love. Now, um, our oldest daughter, Jordan, uh, she just got home yesterday from a six-month tour of duty in the Philippines serving with the UN, and we have, so we haven't seen her. Um, I got to see her in March in, in uh, New Zealand, but no one else has seen her. And what a homecoming when, you, when someone comes back home, and they're back at mom and dad's house. And everybody's so excited, and there's so much love, and there's so many stories being told. And, and, and I just think about what will it be like on the day when we all get home, and we're at dad's house, and we're all united and sometimes people will say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God if you... I don't think he... I don't know if that's going to happen like that. <laughs> I got a few questions I'm going to ask him. I don't know. When you get to, what are you going to do when you get home? What will it be like? The people that have already gone that you, haven't, that you miss so much. And they're there and they're like, hey. Like, oh man. <laughs> so good to see you. And then all the people we've never met. David will be there. Go, oh, there you are. You know me? Oh, yeah, man. We know everybody up here. It's cool. Like, you just know everyone. <laughs> what would that be like? The God that I belong to. The God that I belong to. And it's because of sacrifice. I could only belong to God because God made a huge sacrifice. And God expressed his sacrifice in such a way as that it would remove all doubt of exactly how much God loves me. Because God didn't say, I love you, so I'm going to come and die for you. God said, I love you, so I'm going to send my son to come and die for you. That's a measure of love that I don't think human beings we understand. Um, I have lots of people in my life that I would, I would, without even hesitation, give my life for them. Um, but there's no one in my life that I love that I would give one of my sons for them. You know, Mike and I are old friends, and he's my first friend that I made when I went to Calvary Chapel and became a janitor. And when you're the janitor, you're happy to get any friends. And so Mike was my first friend, and for about a year, my only friend. But uh, he was my friend, and I, I love him. I would lay down my life for him. But if, but if someone called and said, we've taken Mike hostage, and we'll let him go, if you'll give Zach or Ian to die for him, I'll say, well, tell Mike we'll see him in heaven. <laughs> I wouldn't even think about it. I would say, Mike knows the answer to that question. Why would you even call? Like, <laughs> and if they called and they said, hey, Mike's going to die unless you come down here. We want you. We don't really want him. So you come down here and we'll let him go. I'll go, I'll go in a second. But if they say, we'll let him go. You send Zach or Ian. I'll say, kill him. <laughs> Take him, man. He, he's going to heaven. He knows the Lord. Sorry. I love you, but do you understand the point I'm making? Do you feel the same way about your children? You'd lay down your life for somebody, but would you send your... You would not. You wouldn't. You'd just say, hey, man, that's, that's ridiculous. Now, they might, if they called my sons, my sons would want to try to go do it, but, but if they asked me, I'd say, I'd never send my son, ever. Not for anybody. You know? Not for my wife. My wife would kill me if I did that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not joking. She would kill, literally, she'd kill me. So God's, God's chosen to demonstrate his love with something that you could almost say is insane. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God didn't even have two sons. The Father and the Son and the Spirit, the unity of the Godhead expressed in the three persons of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that great mystery of who God is, God sent his son 
And Jesus came and Jesus died on the cross for our sin. That's not something anybody would ever think of. You'd never do that. It's not, it's not reasonable. God has loved us in this amazing, unreasonable way, and he's bought us to himself by sacrifice, so we belong to God. Now, this concept is extremely important because we're considering a statement of Paul made in the middle of a storm in a boat that's about to sink, in a place where he's incarcerated unfairly. And he's been incarcerated for well over two years, at least two years, we know, because the one guy kept him for two years. And now some interval of time, some short amount of time has passed. And now he's shipped off to Rome. So he's been beaten to death because he brought a love offering. Nearly beaten to death. Rescued, but then held as a captive. Political prisoner. Then shipped off, and now he's about to be in a, in a storm that's going to sink the boat. You'll see if you read the story. If you haven't read it, read the story. You'll see the the sailors try to sneak off the boat so, and let everybody else die. And uh, Paul tells the soldiers, unless everybody's on the boat, no one lives. And so they come and cut the boat down. And, and then some of the soldiers are saying, let's kill the prisoners because the Roman law said that if you're guarding prisoners and they escape, guess who gets their sentence? The guards. So they're not going to have any escapees. So the guards are like, we'll kill all these guys. I mean, it's, it's touch and go. This whole scene is touch and go and the boat's sinking and they go so many t days without eating food, and they give up all hope. They throw up all the cargo. I mean, it's as bad as it can be. And in the middle of it, as a guy says, I know who I belong to. The only way you get through the storms in your life, the only way that you get through these crazy circumstances that are inexplicable, is say, you know what's settled for sure in my mind? I belong to God. And no shipwreck, and no crazy soldiers, or weird sailors, or snakes, or, or whatever else could happen, or political gibberish or being a prisoner or whatever, I belong to God, the God that I belong to. I was bought by the blood of Jesus. The Spirit belongs inside of me because I belong to God and I belong in heaven. And that's, that's, that's always the answer. That's the basis of my life. That's the kernel of truth. That's the first question that every person has to answer. Who do you belong to? Now, someone says, well, I'm an agnostic. I don't believe in God, but I don't want to disbelieve in God. I don't think there's enough information. I'm just kind of going through my life being a basically a good person. Well, who do they belong to? Do they belong to somebody? You can figure out who they belong to by looking at their checkbook and seeing who they spend all their money on. Because usually you're, you put your money where your mouth is, right? Like, the money's not ever a liar. You know, you're going to spend your money on what's most important to you. Uh, you could record everything they talk about. See what they talk about the most because what you love the most is usually what you talk about the most. So you could do a little you know, study of their life and come up with a conclusion. What would you find it to be most likely? Probably the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. They're going to belong to something. Everybody's going to belong to something. But is the lust of the flesh worthy of a soul? Is the... The lust of the eyes worthy of a soul is the pride of life worthy of a soul, an eternal soul, a soul that will last forever, a soul that was created by God. What's worthy that you could give yourself to that would be worthy of a human soul? Jesus said, what would a person give in exchange for their soul? The second question, I think, is, is also very, very important, and it, it comes out of the first answer. So what's that one that I belong to, or who do I belong to? Once I've settled that, then the next thing that immediately follows, because I was created for a purpose, Paul says, the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. So first is relationship, but the second question is, what is my purpose? And until a human being figures out what their purpose is, they're going to struggle. And there's Christians that struggle, because they've, they've understood at some level that they belong to God, but they haven't really they haven't really grasped the idea that I'm surrendered to God. And a lot of the life is lived sort of muddled between one foot in the world and one foot in the Lord. And, and yeah, I, I want to do these things, but really I'm super into, into this. And so much energy and time and money gets spent on, on just appealing to my flesh and to what I, how I want things to go. And that really causes our life to get messed up. And so when you get in these situations... Paul's in a set of a, a long-term trial, and that sort of sorts out. It's kind of like shakes up our life. It's, it's, 
It's like we built this thing and then God just comes along and shakes it. And then is anything left? I spent all this time building it and then God goes, <clears throat> and then what's standing still? So that's what's happened to Paul. Like, I'm, a, I'm an apostle. Uh, not for a while. I mean, I used to be an apostle when I wasn't in chains. Now I'm an apostle. The, the A part, I'm not sent out. I'm just, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. The God that I'm serving, God's still working. When he gets to Rome, he'll write a letter from Rome when he's in prison called Philippians. And in that letter, he says, I want you guys to know that the things that have happened to me have turned out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. That's an interesting thing to say. I used to be free and I traveled around and preached the gospel, so God locked me up and actually the gospel is going further. That's encouraging. <laughs> right? You know, it'd be uh, as if uh, the wife goes away for the women's retreat and comes back and the kids are like, we just love it when dad cooks. That never happened at our house, ever. But um, you, know, you come back and you think, really? I... I slave around here and that's the things I get you make one meal and you know yeah Paul is in prison and his purpose is to bring the gospel and these circumstances have happened that have sort of quenched him out but he says I want you to know that the things that have happened to me have turned out rather for the furtherance of the gospel actually what's happened is because of my imprisonment people are more bold to preach the gospel and in fact people in Caesar's household where I'm being held they're actually hearing the gospel too God's actually sent me as a missionary took me a couple years to actually get my visa to make it in there, but he, he ends up in the household in the prison guard of Caesar, so he's sharing with people who are serving in Caesar's palace, and the people are getting saved, and they're taking the gospel. Paul's actually bringing the gospel into the home of the leader of the world. So in the book of Philippians, it's all about joy. So he's got joy because he understands his purpose, but he can only understand his purpose because he understands his identity. I belong to God, and so then my purpose is going to come out of that because in our lives, so many crazy, stupid things will happen to us. Things like, I escaped the shipwreck. Oh, we're making a fire. Picks up the wood, and a snake comes out of the wood and bites him, a poisonous snake. And all the people look and go, wow, karma. He escaped the storm, but man, the gods are against him. He must have done something bad. And they're waiting for him to die, and he throws the snake in the fire, and he doesn't die. And then they think, he must be a god. Superstition, you know, makes us fools. But you look at that, and you, th you know, I remember when I was a kid, we had these little books in grammar school that were, uh, you know, that's the good, you want to know the, the good news or the bad news. You're like, well, tell me the good news. Well, the good news is I got to go flying in a plane with my friend. Well, that's great. Yeah, but the bad news is the engine broke. And you go, oh, that's bad. Well, the good news is we had a parachute. The bad news is we only had one. Well, the good news is my friend took it and jumped out. The bad news is I had to jump out without a parachute. Oh, well, The good news is there was a haystack for me to land in. And the bad news is there was a pitchfork in it. Did you ever read those when you were a little kid? I love those, man. I saw it was so, so hilarious. This whole part of the book of Acts reminds me of that. I'm going to go down to Jerusalem. Well, that's good news. Yeah, I went down there, they beat me to death. Oh, that's bad news. <laughs> I got rescued by the Romans. Oh, that's good news. Then, then they were going to beat me to death. Oh, that's bad news. <laughs> well, then uh, they were, these 40 guys were going to, you know, kill me. But then they rescued me. Oh, that's good news. Yeah, but then they held me as a prisoner for two years. Oh, that's bad news. But then we got a new governor. Well, that's good news. But then he held me too. That's bad news. Well, I got to go to Rome. Well, that's good news. And when we shipwrecked. Oh, that's bad news. But we lived. Oh, that's good news. I mean, it's a joke. It's hilarious. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not exaggerating. That's the story. You read it and you think, this is, I read this book when I was a little kid. This is crazy. How do you live your life when your life looks like that? You've got to know the answer to these two questions. You've got to retreat into the name of the Lord is a strong tower. When the wall goes down, you go to the tower. The tower will never fall. Man, you may lose a wall. You may, you may have the enemy coming through a gate. You may... You may get your hair on fire. You may get some wounds. You get into the tower. The tower will never fall. Why? The name of the Lord. It's the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's the one. That rock that we stand on will never... I mean, it's the rock that comes and smites the image and the image falls 
in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. We, we run into the name of the Lord, the God to whom I belong, but then from that place, that's how we find out why we're living. And Paul knew why he was living. He wasn't trying to write the New Testament. He wasn't trying to be the greatest apostle. He wasn't trying to change the world. He was serving the God that bought him. Now, let me make this really clear. Ministry can become an incredible burden. We see Martha earlier, when we looked at her at the beginning, she's very burdened. Ministry and service can become very worrisome. It can give you ulcers. It can make you frustrated. It can make you angry. It can make you want to quit. It can make you want to give up on people and God. But that's only if you lose track of what's first. The first is, I belong to God. And out of that will come vision and direction and calling. But that, to get to the place where I say, I belong to God, that, that implies a, a huge amount, of the concept of surrender. I, I deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus. I, I lay down my life. I've sur- I'm crucified with Christ. It's about Jesus. It's not about me. And out of that can come the ability to look and say, I'm on a boat. We're going to die. Lord, please let these guys live. Don't let these guys die. An angel comes and says, they're not going to die. The boat's going to be smashed to bits. But if you all stick together, you're going to live. So tell them, all right, guys, we're going to live. <laughs> the boat's going down, but we're going to live. And, and you know, you, he's going to get to preach the gospel to him. And God's doing something in the middle of us. And he ends up in Rome. And when will I get out of this? He could look at it and say, it's unfair. And he could blog Paul from Rome, romeblog.com. And, you know, this is so bad. And no one stood with me. And the Lord remember Alexander the coppersmith. You know, <laughs> writing all this stuff. He could do that, right? He could complain. He could feel sorry for himself. Instead, the God that I belong to, and here I am, I still belong to God, the Spirit belongs in my heart, I belong in heaven, I'm not looking for home on earth, God bought me, what are we doing now? I got a new jail ministry, guys are chained to him, hey, hello, oh, you're on your next four hour shift, well, four hours, well, (laughs) you got two audiences, you want to chain on each side, I mean, I don't know how, how exactly he was there, but he was kept by soldiers. Spend, spending hours with these guys. So tell me about your family. I mean, I know you guys, Romans, believe in a lot of gods. You care if I pray for you? you go, hey, welcome this morning. Hey, come on, let's change your See you guys later. Antonio, Lucius. Come on, come on in, guys. Let's pray. He just, he's just serving the Lord, right? He belongs to God, and he's serving God. This word that he uses here for serve is a strictly religious word. We have a couple of different words in the New Testament that can be translated as serve. The most common one that we use a lot where Paul says, I'm a servant of the Lord or bond slave of Jesus. That's the Greek word uh, that means like manual labor. It's a person that is is bound and they serve in a manual labor sort of a way, uh, doing the dirty work no one else wants to do. This isn't that word. This is a word that's used exclusively for service to God. And it's interesting that he uses it here because what he says here is the God that I belong to and whom I serve. And this particular use of this word has the idea that this is service that only is given to God. Do you know that there's service in your life that only belongs to God? There's energy that you have that is his. You belong to him. And then that means that there's a part of you that first is God's. Now you have to serve. I'm married. I have to serve my wife. I want to serve my wife, but I have to serve her also. The Bible tells me I have to serve her. Paul said, if you're unmarried, you can focus on the things of the Lord. If you're married, you have to think about the things of your wife. And I do. And I'm required to serve her in a certain way, but there's there's a requirement of service to God that supersedes all other service. And this is the question that you have to ask yourself. Are you serving God? The part of you that's His, is it His? You belong to him. He bought you. He made you his. And this is where I think a lot of Christians are muddled in that, okay, the Lord, thanks that I'm going to heaven. Thanks for the fire insurance policy. And now make my life on earth great. Because I don't like my neighbors. Make them move. And uh, I like some new neighbors. Probably one with a cool boat. Um, Not that they would take me on, but maybe they would just let me borrow it. Because I don't really like people. And maybe if they had a cool boat, they'd just let me take it. And... uh, Maybe on the other side, 
a, a neighbor who has a, a lawn service. And then he'll just do my lawn for me for free, just because he's being neighborly. You know, you could live your life where you sort of think that the thing that the life is about, the kernel, the truth, the center of it, is it's about me. But if I belong to God, the center and the kernel of truth about what my life is, it's God. That's the part that has to get settled. And that's where you have to answer the question of, what's my purpose? What am I doing? What is this about? Because if you're Paul and it's about you, then you're really bummed out in this season of your life, aren't you? Acts, the last part of Acts, it's a, just terrible. But if you've settled it, my life is God's. And then what am I doing is that the center of it, the deepest part of who I am is, Lord, what are you doing? Then it doesn't matter what's happening to me. I can always find out what God's doing, right? I'll always be able to find out what God's doing. God will put me in places I would never get into. He could lead me into places and put me with people that I would never, ever end up with. I may not want to be there with them. I may not have ever chosen that. But when I belong to God and then I say, Lord, I'm worshiping you. I'm serving you. My life is about you. Those two questions is who, who I am, who do I belong to, and what's my purpose? Answering those questions are so important because you need to do the work that belongs to God, the work that God has for you, or your life won't, won't be meaningful to you. You'll, you'll be frustrated. You'll always feel like you're not getting what you want to have. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be experiencing what... Uh, the writer to the, of Ecclesiastes, we believe is Solomon, the richest man who ever lived. And, and he writes about how he's pursuing these things, but he says, I was chasing after the wind. When you chase after the wind, you might be in a great race, and you might actually get to the spot where you think you're going to get the thing, but if you're chasing wind, when you go to grab it, it's, there's nothing there. And a person that's living their life, and the main goal is that, that, that thing of, I've got to meet this need for myself, You'll always end up just saying, What's, something's missing, something's not right, something's not happening. And it's not until you say, I belong to God, and so God, what are we doing? And that deepest part of who you are is now surrender to God, and he's that priority, the God to whom I belong and the God whom I serve. My service, my worship is for him. And when he begins to un unveil that and you start to walk in that, well, then it's different, it changes. And then it doesn't really matter about the money or about whether or not your sister's helping you <laughs> or what other people are doing. You know, when you find yourself having bitterness and worrisome and all these different things coming up in your heart and wondering, what are these people doing or what are that people doing? I, I have some friends that are in ministry. I got this one buddy, and I uh, hope he doesn't listen to me. I'm sure he doesn't listen. <laughs> I got this one friend. Man, every time I talk to him, he's talking about what everybody else is doing, and I... Have you heard this person? I go, I don't hear about anybody, bro. I don't hear about anybody. I love all my friends. I don't think about it like that. And he, he's, he's always worried about all these other things. And I, I, just, I just feel so sorry for him. And I just think, man, just let it go. Why is that a big deal to you? I belong to God, and I get to do what he wants to do. And my friends belong to God, and they get to do what God wants to do. And I'm praying for them that they'll figure out what that is. And I hope they're praying for me that I'll figure out what that is. But I get to belong to God and do with God what God's doing. You can't, you can't, money won't give you what that will give you. You want to talk about a sense of satisfaction or hope or peace or meaning or reason? Now, Paul's in a very challenging situation, but... There's some surrender that's happened in his life. And uh, I don't know that he handled it perfectly all the time, but clearly at this moment, he's got the victory. And he may, um, he may struggle like we struggle. I'm sure he does. This story just sort of focuses on Paul's, uh, Paul's walking through this incredibly confusing, difficult, challenging season of his life. And right in the middle of it, as he's talking to these unbelievers... He gives him the reason why he can hang on. The God that I belong to and the God that I serve. He spoke to me and told me what's happening. That's called having a relationship with Jesus. The God that I belong to, the God that I serve. He spoke to me and told me what's happening. No matter what you're going through in your life, if you get a hold of that, that'll get you. That's money right there. That'll get you. That'll get you to the other side. 
If God reminds you, hey, you belong to me. I love you so much. If he pours out his love in your heart, if the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit and the ownership that God takes over you, the love that he wants to pour into your life comes into your heart. And then if God begins to speak and say, this is what we're doing. This is why this is happening. I don't want this to happen. I know, but I'm doing this. Just do this right now. All right, I'm not going to be able to do it right now. (laughs) I'm not going to be able to do this for five minutes. I'll be with you. I love you. Let's do it. And then the God that I am, the God who's I am, the God that I serve, and he spoke to me. That's, that's all Christianity is. Have you found the work that's God's that he has for you? And have you given yourself to it? If you haven't, let me tell you how to find it. Well, we're going to sing a closing song, and uh, there'll be some guys up here that'll be willing to pray with you, but it's just super simple. You can just say, God, show me the work that you have for me. That's it. That's all you got to do. It's free. You don't have to give today. That's a free one. It's a fact that it's all free. You don't have to give it all. The sermon's free. You're saying, yeah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> all you have to do is say, God, show me how much you love me. I think I'm forgetting how much you love me. Show me how much you love me. And God... Show me what you have for my life. And you know what? God will hear that prayer. His eyes are going throughout the whole earth. He'll see you pray that prayer, and he'll hear it, and he'll say, awesome, I'll show you. And he'll start to pour his love into your heart. You can open your heart to the love of God. You can ask God to show you, and he'll begin to reveal what he's wanting to do and how he wants to use you. And, and he'll, do, he'll let things happen that you don't understand, um, but he'll be with you in it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your grace and your patience toward us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you, Lord, for truth and, Lord, that you redeemed us. Lord, that you loved us so much that you demonstrated it with an expression of love that we would never fathom, the giving of a son, that Jesus, you came, sent by the Father to die and die our death. But thank you, Jesus, for rising from the dead and being victorious and for winning. And I would just pray, Lord, that you'd inspire us this morning. I pray for those that are struggling and suffering. Pray, Lord, for those that need a fresh touch of your spirit to understand your love. I pray for those that need a commissioning. Maybe they understand these things, but there's, they've just been muddled in their thinking and wondering why it doesn't make sense. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to come to the place of worship, that they would get both of those statements, the God that I belong to and the God that I serve. Lord, for those that aren't serving you, they're living for themselves. And a life lived like that will always feel empty, will always feel confusing. I I pray, Lord, that this moment right now would be a moment that they would just say, Lord, I want to serve you. Help me. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. So help me. God, I pray that you'd speak to your people. And if there's anybody here who needs to come to Jesus, thank you, Lord, for come to Jesus moments. The, sh- the sailors on the boat and the soldiers are going to have a come to Jesus moment in our story. And, and Paul's there to tell them about how to get to Jesus. And I'm sure some of them came. Probably meet him in heaven. And so, Lord, I pray if there's anybody here who needs to come to you, that they would come to you right now that they would respond. They would hear your voice. They'd hear you knocking at the door and they would say, I belong to God. I don't belong to anyone else or anything else. I belong to God. God bought you. You belong to him, so come to him and live for him. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Please forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the dead. And I put my hope in you. Save me, Jesus. I pray these things in your name. Father, answer these prayers that we're praying. Answer them beyond what we could ask or think, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.